front except for the front row, which is candidates. Everyone, please move to the front. Nothing like playing to an empty house. Hello, please take your seats. If you still want to eat, you can eat at your seats. Front row is candidates. Please, please take your seats. Please move forward. Please move forward. I'm looking out at a sea of empty chairs, and it feels horrible. Right, Dave? Oh, all these people are checking in. I know everybody by name. If you don't move to the front, I'm calling your name. Susan Blanchard. <laughs> Come on, Bruce, move to the front. Come on, you guys. Come on. <laughs> I see all the people checking in. Thank you. Huh? I'm getting them. They're all still checking in. All right, so um, um, our April 5th candidate forum meeting is now called to order. And I know people will be trickling in, but I do want to welcome you all here. Uh, I'm Cara Robin. I'm the president of the West LA Democratic Club. And thank you, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Julian. <laughs> I do have a few fans here. Anyway, I'm really happy you all took some time on this beautiful Saturday afternoon to come on out. And uh, hold on, Joan. My mic needs to be louder. Kelly, all right, so I can talk closer. Wait. Okay, is this better? All right. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Thank you, candidates, for being here. I am, I am thrilled that you all come out and let us hear from you because this is, such, this is so important. Um, all the questions you'll be asked, what we want to hear from you, um, just so we know, so we have an informed decision when we go to the ballot, so we know who we're talking about. So uh, it's real important that you come out and and participate in these, and we do appreciate it. Um, I want to uh, welcome a few of you who are here who've come, made the trip out with us. Uh, I think Sheila Mickelson is here, president of the Westchester Playa Club, and Julian Berger, who's driven up from the South Bay, He's president of the Progressive Democrats of the South Bay. Dempsey Nelson is here, Vice President of the Beach Cities Democrat. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Linda Lux is here, President of the Venice Neighborhood Council. I mean, and I hope I'm not leaving anyone out because I'm, I'm kind of getting, I can't see so well from up here anymore. Um, and I do want to have an announcement that Mark Salzberg, Mark, and uh, Kelly Willis are both running for Venice Neighborhood Council. Mark is running, yeah. <laughs> Mark is running for vice president, and Kelly is, I believe, for community officer. So you're all Venetians. Go out and vote for our West LA Dumb Club people. The election is, I don't know, tell us, Mark. May 18th. May 18th. What time? At the, at the Westminster School? At the Westminster School. So there are flyers on your seats. There are flyers all around being circulated. So please take advantage of it. Uh, I think we can actually get going here. I've got, we have, we're very lucky today to have um, the, our wonderful club member, Dave Day. And also, he's a great comedian, by the way. 
<laughs> as our moderator. And uh, Dave is a wonderful writer. If you have not read him, you should. He writes for Salon.com, for The Guardian, The New Republic, The American Prospect, and other publications. He's great. Plus, he's coming out with a weekly, which he'll tell you about. Uh, Dave will tell you the ground rules of today. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anything. Oh, yes. Ladies restrooms, stage left. Men's re restroom, stage right. Okay? Um, let me see if I have any other. Oh, and you know what else? Those great chocolate chip cookies. I want to thank Daryl Barnett for those. She, her, yeah, she's so wonderful, and she offered them to us. So thank you so much, Daryl. Where are you? There she is in the back. Okay, so it is my pleasure, my great pleasure, to introduce Dave Dan. Thank you. you can give him a thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank you, Cara. Thanks for putting us together, as always. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about some of the issues affecting our great state. So uh, just a little bit on the ground rules, um, because of some uh, scheduling issues, actually, uh, we're not, uh, at least for the state senate race, we're not going to begin with everybody on stage. Uh, what's going to happen is we're going to call up each candidate uh, one by one. Uh, they will start with a three-minute opening statement. Uh, after that, uh, we will do a one-on-one -on -one conversation where I'll ask them questions in five uh, issue areas. Uh, the, the issue areas will do the same. The questions might not be. Uh, so you can't sit there and just take notes and, uh, on the question. Um, and then after that, uh, we will have everybody up here uh, and we will give you a chance to ask questions from the audience as well. So that's how the state senate debate is going to go. I'll, I'll give the ground rules for the uh, Board of Supervisors debate uh, afterwards. And we'll have a little break in between the two debates. I know it's a long day, so thanks for uh, staying with us. Um, there are actually, there's an additional uh, uh, candidate in the race who wasn't able to be with us, uh, but he, he did send a letter uh, this is Vito uh, Imbeschiani, I believe, and uh, I'm, I'm going to read the letter uh, right now, and then we'll start with the debate. So here's the letter. Hello. I am sorry I'm unable to attend the West LA SD26 candidate forum today. I wish I could be with you. However, my duty as state surgeon of the California Army National Guard has called me away this weekend. My name is Vito Imbaschiani, and I am running for the State Senate because we need leaders who are committed to public service, not serving a powerful few or special interests. I am a first-time candidate. I have never run for office, but I have dedicated my life to public service. I have served in uniform for almost 28 years in two wars and four deployments. I know what it means to serve my community. I've been doing it on a one-on-one -on -one basis for years, both in an army uniform and in my surgical practice at Kaiser West LA. Now I want to take that experience and continue my service representing you in Sacramento. I also know what it means to make sacrifices for that service. As a gay man in the military, I had to keep my family a secret in order to serve my country. No one was at the armory when I was deployed, no one was at the airport on my return, and I could not tell anyone about my partner and our adopted sons. That's why I was so incredibly honored and proud to do my duty when President Obama pointed to me and thanked me for my service and said I was an inspiration for ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell. After Prop 8 was ruled unconstitutional, my partner and I got married. Assembly Speaker John Perez officiated with the help of our two young boys serving as ring bearers. These two boys changed our lives dramatically. Although it was a struggle for two gay men to adopt them out of the foster care system, the rewards for all of us have been tremendous and give us greater impetus for me to serve as your senator. My life has been one of service to my community, my state, and my country. While I cannot be with you all today, I hope you will forgive me and consider casting your ballot for me. Thank you for your time. So. That is Vito. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Well, we have to turn this off. Okay. All right. So we are going to now bring up the candidates one by one. Uh, we're going to do it uh, backwards alphabetically. 
Uh, and, and candidates, uh, once you come up, we'll do the one-on-one. -on -one. We can do that right here, and then afterwards you can take your seat uh, in front of your, your name card there. So uh, we're going to start with then Patrick Verone. So I'll have you come up. And Patrick, you can use this mic here, and you have three minutes to do, deliver an opening statement. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. Uh, the notion that a writer would have the stage to himself is absolutely terrifying. So please forgive me. Uh, uh, my name is Patrick Verone. I've uh, lived in this district uh, 27 years. I came here <clears throat> when I was five. Um, thank you for laughing at how old you think I am. I, I turned it on. Green light, just talk like this. Okay, well, I hope I don't have a communicable disease to pass on to any, anybody else who uses it subsequently. Um, I've been a television writer for the past uh, 20, 27 years. Uh, my credits include The Tonight Show, uh, The Simpsons, uh, and Futurama. Um, besides the feedback, you will also possibly know me as the guy who was the elected president of the Writers Guild of America West uh, when I led my fellow writers on a 100-day strike to get us the, the middle-class benefits that all of us uh, deserve, including, uh, uh, thank you, very kindly. Um, but allow me to enumerate those benefits. Uh, fair, play, uh, fair pay and fair play, uh, uh, portable uh, health insurance, and uh, a secure retirement. I'm just going to talk really loud. Um, I'm now before you as a, as a candidate for the state senate, uh, hoping to uh, go to Sacramento and continue that struggle for middle class benefits for all of us um, against many of the same entrenched corporate entities and in the interest of the same populist goals that, uh, that we faced at the Writers Guild. Um, one of my, my, there were three goals that we had at the Guild when I was there. Organize, organize, and organize. Today I come to you with three new goals. Fight for the middle class, fight for the middle class, and fight for the middle class. Um, I look forward to meeting, thank you. I look forward to meeting all of you today or on the campaign trail, uh, answering your questions, and of course, reading all your spec scripts. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. So we'll just have you stand here. Okay. We'll, we'll try to find a place without any feedback, any feedback. here. Um, so thank you, uh, and as, as someone who, who signed a Writers Guild card as, uh, as part of your reality storytelling campaign and didn't get anywhere, I won't hold that against you. Well, thank um, you. We, we tried really <laughs> hard to get somewhere. Yeah. Get. Anyway. Um, okay. Okay, okay, so let's start. No, no, it's not a strike at all. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll start with our first uh, issue area. Uh, you uh, are, are running to get elected to a state senate that is currently uh, in crisis. Uh, there are three members uh, on the Democratic side who have been suspended. This is the first time in history that uh, members of the state senate have been suspended. Uh, how uh, would you uh, endeavor to restore the integrity of a legislature that uh, many feel has become distant and uh, uh, disconnected to uh, ordinary concerns of working people? Um, first of all, I would refuse to take any calls from anybody named Shrimp Boy. <laughs> I think it's very important. That Probably we, a good idea. Yeah. You know, uh, in, in a way, that's, that's job one. But in another way, I think that's, that's easy. I mean, to, to the, the notion of, of, of money corrupting politics is something that I don't think is, is, is new to anybody. Who, who follows the, uh, the profession, as it were. I'm new to, to this kind of politics. I've been dealing with, with, with Writers Guild politics. I've, I've worked with, with cartoon characters and puppets for many years, so, <laughs> so politics seems like the next logical step. But to me, and, 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 and I've actually taught, I've taught ethics. Uh, it was actually ethics and entertainment law, very short course, but, but the notion of <laughs> making the general public Building confidence in uh, their elected representatives as as being faithful to, 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 to them, and I mean, I think the biggest thing, and as, as a first-time candidate, that I'm discovering is just how much time is spent 
raising money. And I think that needs to be uh, amended, certainly. I mean, I don't want to unilaterally say I'm going to stop taking or stop uh, uh, fundraising, but it seems very important to me that we lower either the, the, the caps on spending or do something so that that's not what this job is about. Okay, great. All right, we'll, we'll get, move into the next area, and that's the state budget. The, the proposed 2014-15 budget, if you adjust for inflation, ha has still not reached the dollar level of the 2007-2008 budget. What we are, uh, despite a much larger population, critical state services were cut during the recession, things like IHSS, CalWORKs, uh, and even though we have a $6.3 billion unanticipated revenues over the past three years, we currently run a surplus, those cuts have yet to be restored. Uh, how can we restore funding and meet these basic needs Again, in California, must we live under continued austerity six years after the recession? No, no austerity is, is simply out of the question. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's essential. I'm sorry. All right. Do you want to get on this mic? Because this mic does seem to work if, you, if you're close to it. Yeah. All right. All right. Go ahead. Uh, I, I was saying austerity seems to be a fool's task at this point, that if we have a surplus, we should be able to use it. We should use it intelligently. We should try to restore the things that were taken away during the Great Recession. But I also think that we need to, it's not going to be enough. At some point, some, uh, something else is going to go wrong. And I think we need to do things that, that, that raise revenue in an intelligent fashion. I'm talking about changing Prop 13 so that it affects uh, uh, businesses, commercial interests in a way that it wasn't supposed to originally. Uh, I mean, the, the funding, uh, the, the eighth largest uh, budget in the, in the world, in, in the richest country in the world, in the, one of the richest states in that country, seems to be uh, a, a, a task that shouldn't fall uh, un, under the carving knife. It should be about uh, generating revenues and dis distributing it in ways that, that, that make that makes sense, that, 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 that fulfill the obligations that we're all up here to, uh, uh, that we're all up here to achieve. Great. Great. Thank you. You can stay there. Um, can, can we hear this? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, next issue sure. area, we have uh, the environment. On February 28th, the LA City Council approved a moratorium on fracking, rank and file Democrats have publicly criticized the governor over his stance on the issue. Uh, do you believe we should continue with fracking as an option, or do you support legislation to begin a moratorium? No, of course. The let's, yeah, let's, let's not only poison our own current water, but the, but the groundwater for the future. Uh, no, it seems like fracking uh, is, is the, the, the word comes from Battlestar Galactica and is used in a different, in a different way when we talk about things fracking. But, it's, but it, it has the same effect. We're, we're not, I mean, I, I that's actually another place where I think we can get revenue through 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 the oil extraction tax that so many of the other oil company oil states have that we don't. Um, so no, fra fra fracking seems like seems like a mistake. Okay. All right. We'll move on, uh, and we'll move on to education. And by the way, I drove here in my electric plug-in. Oh, excellent. That uh, I, I uh, going after the I, Nel the Dancy Nelson I, vote. Right yeah. Well, thanks to the solar power on the top of my roof. So. Okay. Very good. Okay. So uh, education is the next category. What is your position on Governor Brown's uh, local control funding formula, which passed last year, and this gives more money to school districts with higher percentages of low-income students or English language learners? Last year during negotiations, uh, uh, the uh, percentage of money that would go to uh, uh, in local control funding formula was taken down. Uh, and spread out to richer schools, including many in this district. Uh, does California have a responsibility to ensure that education dollars go to where the needs are most acute? There, there was an old adage that we would apply at the, at the Writers Guild when we'd go into collective bargaining um, sessions where the pattern of demands uh, was being determined and, and the companies would ask, so what are your demands? And the answer would be one word, more. 
and I think that applies to education funding. Uh, the di dis distribution of it, I mean, it should be equitable. It should be to places that need it, but I think the pie needs to be bigger at this point, and, and, and uh, that, those problems get solved with more money going into the educational system, I think. All right. Uh, we'll move on to uh, health care. Uh, despite the success of the Affordable Care Act and Cover California, uh, up to three million state residents will remain uninsured, including close to a million here in Los Angeles County. Uh, and a lot of that is due to federal restrictions on undocumented individuals from uh, purchasing uh, health care on the exchanges. And so many of them will never be able to acquire coverage. Uh, Senator Ricardo Lara has a bill to expand Medi-Cal without federal dollars and allow the undocumented to purchase health insurance in California. Do you support this and uh, or do you support other measures to ensure that everyone, regardless of status in California, is covered? Yes. <laughs> and, and if I may elaborate, no, I... I, I I think as part of comprehensive immigration reform, we have to be able to make sure that the people who, who come to this country uh, are, are not only, uh, you know, can get jobs, can get education, but can also remain healthy. Um, and, and beyond that, single payer seems to be the solution to all of this. Excellent. Okay, uh, we're going to do, I, I guess we got time for one more maybe. Uh, Okay, so this is in the broad area of poverty and consumer protection. Mm -hmm. uh, nearly half of all unemployed Californians have been out of work for six months or more. And uh, currently they have no emergency federal benefits from which to draw. Uh, what can uh, the state legislature do to help fix this enormous problem that we have with the long-term unemployed, which is gonna be with us for years and years and years? How can we create incentives for businesses to take a chance on the long-term jobless. I mean, in my industry, we're we're in the middle of a tax incentive push in the uh, uh, in the legislature to to try to keep Hollywood, which used to be the film capital of the world, is now the film capital capital of the world, and that the the actual work and the jobs have gone to Louisiana and 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 many other places. And I I think. Job creation should be job one. I do think, though, that job creation and the incentives that go along with it for corporate entities need to be very specifically tailored so that they actually create jobs. In other words, that, that the incentive that goes along with keeping uh, a, a, a major multinational conglomerate in California makes sure that, that the money that that fulfills that incentive goes into the creation of jobs and into the wages and, and benefits of, of, of working people and working families and not into the pockets of the CEOs and into the profit uh, of the shareholders. Um, you know, long term, I think job creation is what, what, how people get hired, how, how the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the remarkable recovery that California is bound to have, where that's going to come from. Great. Well, thank you, Patrick, and uh, we'll check back with you later. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, we have Amy Howarth, and she's going to give you a little opening statement. So, thank you, and uh, here you go. Oh, boy. <laughs> I think I'll wait till the sirens are done. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, David, no and thank you all for uh, having us all here today and for all the hard work that you do every election and even when there's not an election, you guys are the folks really doing a lot of good work. So my name is Amy Howarth, and I have lived here, actually my home, for 17 years. My husband Mark and I raised our two sons, Ari and Jack, in Manhattan Beach, and they both attended the public schools there. I first got involved in 2003 when I ran for the school board and Ari was in third grade and I saw a lot of things that needed to change there at the school, at the school district and the school board. And I'm really proud that in the seven and a half, seven and three quarters to be technical years that I was on the school board for two terms, 
We, um, we ha we're facing a fiscal crisis, uh, not due to this, the school, but due to the state. So we had to make cuts, but then we were able to restore a lot of those positions, and we were not able, finally, to give teachers an increase in salary. We rebuilt public trust, and in fact, um, our schools are ranked number three in the state. Um, so I'm very, very proud of those efforts. After I decided that I needed to run for city council because there seemed to be a gulf in the understanding in the community between the school district and the city. And I wanted the city to understand that the property values that they so were so grateful for, for the revenues, were directly due to the schools and the success of the schools. And it was incumbent upon the city to uh, treat the schools fairly and equitably through joint uh, JPAs and joint use agreements. And I was elected to the city council in 2011. And I was, in fact, able to do what I set out to do. I was able to create a joint use agreement, whereas instead of giving $1 a year to the schools for the use of their facilities and parkland, we now, the city now has an agreement where it's $1.4 million. So I'm very proud of that. Um, I have also, uh, while on the city council, done a number of environmental uh, programs and issues that I, I will tell you more about. Uh, I'm, I hope you will ask me about the environment, but we, we, have <laughs> we have banned plastic bags in Manhattan Beach. We have banned styrofoam in Manhattan Beach. We have banned um, straws and lids uh, in Manhattan Beach. We um, are working on a smoking ban in Manhattan Beach. Um, and I'm just very, very proud that a community that, yes, we're small, but we have done a lot of uh, reforms that other cities are looking at. And so I want to go to Sacramento and take the experience and the, the, stuff, the stuff that I've learned over 11 years of being an elected official, 11 years of being responsible for people and their lives and their property, and take that up to Sacramento and make a difference for all of us. Thank you. Great. You just stay right there. You just stay there. I okay. think that'll work. I have no idea what's going on with the uh, no, feedback, okay. but we'll uh, get through that. Are we good with this, though? You can yeah, hear I think me? so. I think right. so. Okay. So uh, I, I'm going to start with, um, with this. Uh, we know that uh, some of the budget woes that California has had have been uh, alleviated by Prop 30. However, we also know that Prop 30 has an end date. And uh, after it expires, it's going to face a, a future of, of we're going to face a future of structural deficits. The Senate did nothing with their two-thirds majority granted by the people when they had it to actually use the revenue side to prepare for this. How should we go about solving the structural deficit? And when Democrats have a two-thirds majority again, how can we uh, make this an actual priority? Thank you. It's a great question. So I was, I was happy about Prop 30 because um, one thing that people didn't realize is when Governor Schwarzenegger made cuts to education back in, I want to say, 2005, those horrible, horrible cuts, we never got our floor um, refunded. So we've been uh, back at the heels for, for a while. Um, one of the things that we have to do across the state is we do have to, if we make more jobs, guess what? When we have more jobs, we have more revenues. Right, so that will absolutely help the uh, state funds uh, in general. Another thing that I believe that we need to do is close the loopholes in Prop 13 at the very minimum. And I know that that's a, a big battle, but that's, that one is one I think there's a lot of agreement on. And the other thing I would say is school districts, I don't know if you know this, but public school districts have to provide a three-year budget to the state in order to be certified. The state only has to provide one year of a budget. And they don't have to provide it when the school districts need it. So uh, I believe that we really need to make it so school districts provide a two-year budget and the state provides a two-year budget. That would really start to go a long way towards correcting that structural uh, deficit that you see, the structural budgeting problem that you see up there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so we, you mentioned education, so let's go to that. Um, uh, K through 12 has seen uh, increased funding mm -hmm. over the past several years. However, uh, child care and preschool funding remains diminished from pre-recession levels. Uh, subsidized uh, slots have cut, been cut 40% despite 
uh, voluminous research showing uh, the benefits of pre-kindergarten and, and preschool uh, on, on the future lives of, of our students. Will you make this a priority? And, and, and I know there are a lot of things in the budget that need to be restored, but is, is pre-K something and childcare something a priority to you? Yes, and you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned subsidized uh, pre-K or preschool and daycare because that is one of the dangers that I, I see sometimes when people talk about universal preschool is funding it for all folks. And I have to say, there are some folks who can pay for preschool, and I don't think the state should take that on. But what I do think is that when you provide really good foundations for children and a way for their parents to be able to work, you know, that's a good, that contributes to the greater good. And those students will do better in school. Their parents will feel better that they can go and work and provide a good, decent uh, living for their family and their students, or their, I'm sorry, their children are well cared for. So I do absolutely support that. Um, but I, I would want to, the, the, the term universal preschool or preschool for all, mm -hmm. I would want to define better. It, it, so that it's not, if someone can afford preschool, mm -hmm. that they are not taking advantage of that. And so the right. state. So you, so right. you want it at a certain level, yes. um, a certain income yes. level. Cap. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so the success of the affordable. The success of the Affordable Care Act cover California means millions more people are covered. However, uh, that creates a supply issue. Uh, recent legislation in California does allow nurse practitioners and other individuals who complete specialized training to perform uh, abortions in California. Uh, do you support additional responsibilities that can be ha handled by nurse practitioners which would increase the supply of medical care statewide, a critical need given the recent increase in the insured population? Right. Well, providing access, at, you're right, if we want to provide access to, to people, we do have to have the practitioners. If um, the nurses, you know, you have to also provide regulation and testing to make sure that folks are qualified. But every time when my children were little and they were sick and, and you have to call at, you know, and you don't talk to a doctor, you usually talk to the nurse. And I got to tell you, some of the best advice I ever got and some of the best care was from those nurses. So I have no doubt that they can handle some of the medical problems because people shouldn't have to go to an emergency room when their child has a fever. But that's the way our system is set up now. And that's one of the reasons it's so expensive. And so if you can allow nurse practitioners to treat children with fevers in clinics and help them, um, that will reduce costs and provide access, much needed access to people. Great. Thank you. Um, so you, you mentioned environment, so we'll, 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 we'll jump to that. Uh, despite, you know, some recent rains, we still have this historic drought in the state. Snow, snowpack levels well below normal. Uh, what measures do you support to control the way the state uses water and the way the stakeholders, including farmers, uh, pay for it? Thank you. Well, yeah, we, we had some rain, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That doesn't create a pattern. Um, I think everything has to be on the table. And what's really interesting, you go to Sacramento, as I know all my fellow candidates have been going up to Sacramento, and they don't have water meters up there. I mean, that, right? they don't have water meters, people. They need water meters. They have, to, they have to reduce water usage as well. Southern California, we've gotten pretty good at it, actually. I would love, um, the agricultural industry has been very successful at lobbying for both federal f subsidies, state incentives, and yet they've done nothing to reduce uh, their water consumption. It's 80% of the water use. So we really do need to get them to uh, explore uh, crops uh, that are water wise, to use drip irrigation. But really everything needs to be on the table when we talk about this. This is an issue that's going to affect us for years. There's more people than there were. You know, there's just a lot more people than there were 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And we need to adjust for that. Um, so everything needs to be on the table, reduce, reuse, drip irrigation, and um, yes. <laughs> Real quick, do you support a tiered pricing model? Where, oh, absolutely, uh, and I'm pushing, I'm, I'm pushing for that in my community. We had, a few years ago, the, the last drought, and I was so sad when I said the drought was over. Oh, wait, I'm not allowed to talk, sorry. I'm not allowed to talk. But no, no, you, you can go. I just, I just, yes, I absolutely support that. That's the best way to get people to reduce. Okay, very good. Um, all right, so uh, what do I want to go to? How about this one? How about this one? Something good. Uh, nationally, 
There are more payday lending branches than McDonald's and Starbucks combined. Commercial banks have almost entirely pulled out of low-income communities, creating bank deserts and forcing poor residents to rely on these non-traditional banking sources that typically charge high interest and fees. Uh, how can the legislature ensure financial inclusion and prevent predatory operations directed at the working poor? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, I think all of us in this room probably wish after uh, 2008 that there had been actual banking reform, um, right? I think that we need to, uh, I, I know our current Senator Lou has done a lot of work uh, to try to get, um, to make folks be able to understand when they take out a mortgage what the language really means. There needs to be more education actually in the schools about financial uh, literacy. Um, but I believe that as a legislature, we probably need to create ways um, to make it easier for banks to go into those communities or, or, or legislate that they need to. It is absolutely a crime. Thank you. Uh, okay, so last, uh, last up, um, I mentioned uh, the, the, the cloud around the state senate right now. What uh, there are a number of ethics reform measures that are uh, currently on, on the docket in Sacramento. Uh, what reforms do you support, not just to reduce the power of, of and, and the attraction of sort of pay to play in Sacramento, but, but to increase the transparency uh, and, and, and reduce this distance between lawmakers uh, up in Sacramento and their constituents? Right. It's, it is a big problem, and it's... it's it's similar, although in orders of magnitude much greater when, than when I got elected to the school board. Um, there were people coming to school board meetings and saying they won't hit school board members' heads on a pike, um, not even exaggerating. And I came in, and um, the other gentleman who got elected when I did, we did things. We said, okay, we're, we're going to pay for our own business cards. We're going to pay for it. We're not going to, you know... Uh, expense out meals, we're not gonna, we're gonna pay for ourselves to go to conferences. I mean, I get it, that's a much smaller example, but I spent six years rebuilding the public trust so then we could pass a bond to build a new building. You know, I have done that hard work, that person-to-person -person work, and it is one of the big challenges. How do you get the people down here to feel like they are really participating and not just those folks who are sitting in the offices up in Sacramento? I don't know the answer. I'm completely for any of that reform. Um, I've been, um, you know, trying to meet with people down here and raise the money down here. I think that what happens is when you go up to Sacramento, it's very hard because those people are around you for three days a week. So you have to come down here and be in the district and meet face to face with the people so that you are saying it's not about your money, it's about your kid. It's about your house, it's about your bank loan. And I think. That's all I can say. I don't know the exact reforms I would do, but I'd be very supportive. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a seat.